Hi guys, again this is Professor Brian Ives Areneta and in one of my DFT subjects um, on uh, social science and fisheries uh, I was uh, tasked to look for a social issue that is related to uh, fisheries. So I came up with this uh, small scale fisheries thing. Okay, so uh, let's have a short talk about uh, a small scale fisheries or uh, shall we say communities and let's uh, try to take a look at the uh, culture of poverty in this sector. Now I know that we cannot uh, totally uh, sort of quantify and um, generalize on the extent of poverty and uh, vulnerability in these uh, groups of people or in these communities because again globally uh, countries differ in terms of um, categorizing or defining small-scale fisheries. Now what I will be offering right now is or are the um, wisdom from the various readings that I read prior to this talk. And uh, there are also some journal art articles that I <clears throat> studied so I can really grasp the uh, perspective of experts who are focused on the sector. And I hope that my um, synthesis can um, reach out policymakers out there and uh, of course uh, government institutions. So they can um, further refine their strategies when uh, addressing small-scale fisheries uh, in this country. Now to the people or uh, stakeholders of the sort of uh, marginalized sector, it's uh, interesting to know how they value their industry. So how they sustain such a uh, vulnerable niche out there. Again, I want to emphasize on their vulnerability. As opposed to the usual illusion of this lack of resources that creates poverty, I'd rather uh, follow that idea that the resources are um, more than adequate. So it is actually, it's simply on the culture, okay, who, of, uh, of, and of course the people who are sort of vulnerable to various sorts of exploitation, maybe uh, illiteracy problems or complications, maybe they have coping difficulties, okay, even climate change can uh, make them vulnerable. Now, if we are to uh, address various challenges in the sector, we need to create strategies that are exclusive to a specific community. So, it should be well understood that uh, small-scale um, fisheries is uh, a distinct and uh, uh, easily recognizable sector. Okay. Now, their richer counterparts should be uh, the large-scale industrial fisheries that uh, utilizes machineries and equipment. Now when we talk about uh, artisanal or small-scale fisheries, it only involves fishing households. Okay, The family or a minority or group of people that uses small fishing vessels, the fishermen, the fisher folks okay, who uses simple fishing gears and of course they sell their catch for local consumption only. Now it's easy to imagine this and uh, identify them here in our country and of course managing the sector is a lot more problematic than the large-scale ones why because of course the large-scale um, industries are following global standards and policies and take note that uh, both are fish capturing sectors so meaning uh, uh, they are competing with each other both in uh, resource acquisition and uh, trade. Now, uh, who do you think has the advantage here? Okay, so who is, who is given more attention by the government? Who is the better taxpayer? Okay, of course, I don't want to create a, a grim picture here, but that's the reality. So if it doesn't contribute that much, if it's hard to manage, if it's only local, then uh, they are more likely to be... Uh, less favored okay now with the current proposal to decentralize our government by the uh, federalism route or campaign in theory i believe that it will be more to the advantage of small-scale fisheries because uh, again every economic island here in the philippines can uh, focus more on localized needs and uh, deliver interventions immediately it is easy to add more value to the fisherman's products for example and as I have mentioned a while ago, the solutions to problems can be uh, uh, 
sort of tailored specifically to the needs of the local community. Now, if these potential reforms cannot happen, uh, this sector will continue to face the pressures of uh, globalization, also your resource depletion and uh, climate change. And uh, there is much diversity in the culture and the people that are within the small-scale fisheries department. Okay, the uh, opportunity for social science research okay, is vast. And uh, actually, poverty is only one of them. Okay, now actually, I'm supposed to discuss this within a more organized outline. What are my insights on um, how to avoid poverty? Actually, aquatic resources uh, is so vast. So just think of the oceans. That's more than 70% uh, of water covering the surface of the planet. Okay, that doesn't include the, the volume. That's only the surface. I mean the um, surface cover. So also try to think of the volume, okay? The, uh, the, 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 the volume of possibilities that it can generate. We can actually drown the entire human population in an ocean of food, okay? So always think twice before declaring that our food security is hanging in a tight balance. Of course, uh, I'm also exaggerating. But uh, think about it. So why is poverty an issue for uh, these people who are connected to these aquatic resources? Okay. Uh, sometimes I see posts in the social media about success stories of uh, college graduates and um, they have passed the board exams or they have these medals. And then there's a line saying that their parents are simply uh, fisher folks. Okay. Or... Uh, or fishermen so meaning uh, fishermen are or fisher folks are seen as poor okay imagine the money that you can get actually by just capturing fish then selling them uh, directly instead of culturing and selling so actually you can sell every day capture and sell every day instead of uh, for example in the case of aquaculture you you need, still need to feed, to culture, to take care of the fish. You buy feeds, okay? And you can get your, <clears throat> your income after, let's say, months of waiting. So how come that uh, these uh, people in the um, capture fishery sector uh, are still poor, okay? And by the way, guys, before I forget, um, let us limit these small scale fisher folks to capture fisheries uh, because again of course uh, obviously uh, they cannot afford to come up with an initial capital in, in venturing into aquaculture so if we think about uh, global fish catch in the past let's say 50 years perhaps it increased twice as much or even more uh, maybe I'll uh, research and paste it here later, the current statistics, after editing this video. And uh, in the data actually that I got in the five-year fisheries imports and exports here in the Philippines, uh, I recall that about 40% of uh, fisheries products coming from the capture fisheries are being bought and sold in international markets. Okay, uh, China has been the leader in Asia. And um, a few important points should come into our minds if we hear this. Actually, industrialization is sweeping across the oceans, and the first world countries are also leading the race. So, uh, if we look at the small scale fisher folks, are they involved here? Or uh, do they contribute also to these impressive um, yields? Actually, it's even worse in the uh, aquaculture sector or in the aquaculture industry because again 80% uh, of the production actually came from first world countries so this actually widened the gap between um, small scale fisheries and large scale industrial fisheries we should expect our local fisher folks uh, taking the role of scrappers or sweepers of leftovers from the big corps. So come to think of it, 
even in um, local stores, uh, they are still selling canned fish goods, tuna, sardines. Uh, these are from industrialized fisheries. So it's everywhere. It's also cheap. And uh, so the majority of the local population are buying it. And also due to industrialization, we have the rise of uh, the middlemen who benefit more from the uh, supposed to be direct transactions between the fisher folks and your large-scale industrial suppliers. For example, you can look at the uh, prices in popular restaurants. Okay, you can, um, for example, a kilogram of shrimp can cost around, uh, let's say, 200 pesos. That's about four four dollars. But uh, in restaurants, it can be priced now at uh, 1,000 pesos, or that can be 20 dollars in a restaurant table. And it could even be higher if uh, sold outside the country. And lastly, um, the poor also competes with their fellow poor. I believe that the uh, employees of large companies, of large fisheries companies, also came from the uh, marginalized sectors like your small-scale fisher folks. So how can small-scale fisheries improve when uh, some of their constituents or maybe most of their constituents are uh, are sort of uh, working for the big companies for the big corporations so they they prefer to get out of their current situation that they perceive as uh, poverty stricken so they work for the big fisheries companies to and uh, of course that adds more pressure to their sector uh, we also have the rise of uh, information and communications technology. They also further lessen the opportunities for the marginalized. So, for example, if you can sell your fisheries products on Facebook, then you are doomed. Okay, uh, Other uh, sellers are of more advantage than you. Uh, technology increases access to food supply and uh, small-scale fisher folks must cope up if they want to add more value to their goods. We also have uh, transportation. It has also improved the uh, sellability of uh, freshly captured goods. Okay, You have mobile sellers. They are sucking profit out of, of people who are actually there in the seas. Okay, Spend um, a lot of energy to harvest these fish products. So the final idea that can be taken out from these situations is that the money that comes from our aquatic resources are not distributed equally okay, between your small and uh, uh, large-scale fisheries. Uh, what happens if we have unequal distribution of monetary gains? So of course, the wealth can easily escape this country because the uh, stockholders of the big corporations will, of course, invest it. In international tra trade, okay, we uh, use the human body as an analogy. Imagine that um, wealth, the resources are moving in, in your blood vessels. So if uh, blood only moves in the uh, major blood vessels like your veins and arteries, and if they don't go to the capillaries, okay, the smallest, the most numerous of the blood vessels, then it will also arrest the tissues or organs that um, rely on it for nutrients and for waste exchanges even the heart will die if you don't allow blood to move towards the capillaries that nourish the heart again there is a vast resource out there so who should benefit the most from it in this um, present society that we have if you check my uh, mangroves and um, seagrass video i was able to make a rough estimate of how much we can get per hectare of mangroves or uh, seagrass cover. So it's a fair, fairly a huge uh, or a large sum. And we know that uh, small scale fisher folks also have access to this. I, I even, that's only for the estuarine environments. I haven't yet included the oceanic zones, the coral reefs, for example. But then here comes the uh, large scale fisheries who can also access it better, who depletes. Uh, the resources faster okay and then uh, <clears throat> maintain that most of the so-called cash flow is uh, only limited to their sector so here 
I hope that um, you have increased your interest in uh, finding solutions to um, end poverty in the uh, small-scale fishery sector. But uh, sadly, I believe that poverty can never be eradicated. Okay, of course, I'm not a poverty expert. Um, the true experts are supposed to be the poor people themselves. So if they are the experts, then uh, they must be able to, to uh, eradicate poverty because they know better than the rest of us. Uh, if only I can um, interview somebody who was once a small-scale fisher folk and um, is now currently working out a solution to improve their situation. But sadly, those uh, we perceive to have escaped poverty, uh, they simply moved out of the community via the various means of social mobility, uh, routes like education, uh, hard work, luck, okay, help from other sectors. And uh, only the people move out. Okay, but of course, the communities still remain. Okay, the original community stays there. And... Um, of course, the government is in a dilemma on who to prioritize. If they uh, fully support the uh, small-scale uh, fishery sector, um, there will come a time that they will eventually uh, start thinking of um, bigger income. Because again, humans are uh, insatiable. And so a great deal of regulation is uh, needed here. I am becoming more subjective here and philosophical. So uh, my last words about this is that uh, since the role of this sector is uh, vital to the health of our society and um, as noted a while ago, it's hard to eradicate poverty by simply converting this into the large-scale fisheries industry. It's also too hard to maintain uh, the distribution of wealth among these fisheries sectors. Uh, the government should at least... Uh, Make sure that uh, the citizens there are happy, okay? And if they are not happy anymore, uh, the government should also place there various opportunities for uh, moving out of that place. Because of course, if uh, lots of them moves out of uh, that sector, there will be less pressure within it, so less competition. Uh, this is how I look at it. Maybe we should improve also on the dynamics of the sector. We, we have flexibility and resilience. This must be nurtured. And people here can stay or go, okay, with whichever or whatever they like. Now, of course, right now I cannot tell you how. Maybe I need to go back to my readings somewhere. And um, I'll tell you our options when I have new perspectives at hand. Alright guys, so that's it for now. Again, this is Professor Brian Ives Araneta. Thank you very much for watching.